Hi, everyone. It appears as though we are live. I'm waiting for my business partner to come back with a pot of coffee. I'm waddling back over. Come here, Cody. We'll get started here in about a minute. Thank you. Here, let me grab that. Oh, yeah, we're on, aren't we? Hi, everyone. We're wasting everyone's time as we <laughs> We're really good at that. Phone is on mute because I'm not an amateur. All right. <laughs> Want to get started? Hey, let's, let's do this. Do Hi, uh, my name is Isaac. Hi, guys. I'm Cody. Uh, we are co founders at, of at Koto Design here in Indianapolis, Indiana. And we're here today to discuss how brand architecture can be used to grow your brewery. This is an often overlooked component of the brand strategy process. And in our perspective or our opinion, it's become increasingly important over the last several years, last three or four years, as more and more breweries transition from being a craft brewery to a beverage company. Uh, we've helped a lot of breweries open a second, third, or fourth location. We've helped folks launch hard seltzer extensions, kombuchas, RTV cocktails, open new distilleries and restaurant concepts, and getting into all sorts of non-beer stuff. And, and the goal of launching these new products is to, number one, meet your customers where they are, so there's a lot of shifting tastes and consumer trends right now, but also growing your business and making you more resilient. And our thesis for today's talk, the reason we're giving a presentation on brand architecture is that if you are not careful with how you manage these new extensions, you can actually hurt your overarching brewery brand. Uh, we've got about 30 minutes to talk today. We're gonna be moving quickly. Um, if you have questions at all, please throw them in the comments section there. We will pause in the middle of the talk. And then again, at the end, we'll leave as much time as possible to field those questions as we get there. We'll answer any question you all have on any of this. So far, looks like we're transitioning fine. Uh, quick background on us. Kodo is an 11 year old food and beverage branding firm. As I mentioned, we're based in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, we founded Kodo the Monday after graduating college back in 2009, based on the belief that we can create better work by directly including our clients in the creative process. Since then, we've grown to be a seven person shop and we work with breweries all around the world on their branding and we help people sell more beer. We're brought in to help people increase revenue and profit and all that good stuff. The bulk of our work these days is helping establish breweries rebrand. Uh, we gave a presentation on that topic just yesterday. If you guys uh, didn't see that and you wanna, you wanna see more of our, our stuff uh, at the on the Craft Beer Professionals YouTube channel, but uh, we, we're at our best when we help folks define their positioning and brand strategy, their identity, websites, and developing internationally recognized packaging. And, and as I mentioned, we are a food and beverage branding firm. Uh, you wouldn't know that looking at our website <laughs> because I do a poor job of curating our work, but we do lots of work with uh, Beyond Beer, with bars and restaurants and hospitality groups, distilleries, loads of work with cannabis startups, CPG food and bed products, primarily consumer facing, but we do some B2B stuff as well. Uh, a couple other points here, and we'll get into the topic today. So we've written a few books, uh, including our latest release, Craft Beer Rebranded. You can learn more about brand architecture and the entire topic that we're talking about today at craftbeerrebranded.com. Sorry to hit you with the commercial this early, but this is a 180-page book and a 60-page companion workbook that will help you navigate each step of your brewery's rebrand. And if you stick around to the end of the talk, we will give you a free code for shipping here within the United States for your trouble. Lucky you. Yeah, lucky you. Cody, why are we here today? Um, so we're throwing around this phrase brand architecture, but um, we're going to kind of dive into what that means and how you can make that work for your brewery, for your business. Um, people have had to get a lot more creative lately because of what's happened in the market. So we're going to kind of walk through the common approaches to solving those brand architecture issues, <laughs> kind of the different models, the different sort of abstract um, ways to organize your different brands on, in your portfolio. Um, and we're also going to talk about extensions with an exclamation, with an exclamation yeah. point. Um, we're going to talk about some of the interesting things that we've seen lately. We're going to show some examples of product extensions, line extensions, um, kind of the interesting ways that breweries have dipped their toes into new markets. So we'll start off by defining brand architecture. So this is a framework for determining how all of your brands, current and future, interact with each other. Um, how do specific brands relate or differ? How are they positioned, named, priced? How do these things add up to help you build a more resilient business? Uh, some examples, as we mentioned at the top of this talk, we see a lot of folks opening a pre and even now during COVID uh, 
opening a new location, second, third location, a uh, production facility, launching extensions is probably going to be the bulk of why people are here watching this today, whether that's a seltzer or a kombucha, an RTD cocktail or something like that. And again, all sorts of non-beer things that breweries open. So a couple of the common approaches, if you just Google brand architecture, it really boils down to these two approaches. And then there are a lot of subtleties within these. So it's branded house versus a house of brands. Branded house is um, centers around a strong parent brand that lends its name to all of its products uh, and your products themselves support the main parent brand without having their own identity. Now to, to make sure this makes sense, this is the most common architecture approach that you all come to market with, the breweries come to market with because it builds an overarching strong brand that le uh, lend the reason you do this, the reason branding is, is what it is today in 2020 is because that that lends trust to whatever it is you're you're releasing. Um, so some examples. This is a this is a really good kind of corporate example because you can actually see like literally FedEx, the, the logo just switching colors on everything. And then there's sub brand services, Office Express, whatever changes. Um, in the beer space, Prost, uh, this is a client of ours, Prost. This is actually a really good example because they don't even have fanciful names. It's a German style brewery. So Prost Pills, Prost Vice Beer, Prost Dunkel. Uh, everything supports the Prost name. Uh, some more examples here. And as we mentioned, this is very common for craft beer to do. I do want to, to mention, uh, because some people have questions about this when we talk about it, this doesn't mean you can't have fanciful beer names. It's just that everything flies under the banner of your main brewery brand. So this is Southern Brewing, uh, another client of ours out of Athens, Georgia, Hobnail IPA, uh, Fog Machine, 7 AM, which is one of my favorite named beers, all under Southern Brewing. Uh, left Field, another client of ours, everything comes from Left Field. Every new release promotes the main parent brand. Another client of ours, Plain Spoke Cocktails, same thing. Kettle House, same thing. Uh, I went backwards there because I'm unprofessional. Let's keep going forward. This extends to tap rooms now when you get out of packaging. So uh, Prost has two locations. I think they're actually building a production facility as well. But all of those bear the Prost name. It's not like some other crazy name concept. It's Prost Denver and Prost Foco is what they call it colloquially. Uh, this is Dust Bowl Brewing Company. Uh, this is not a client of ours, but we're fans of them. Uh, they've got three different tap rooms. They are all called Dust Bowl, you know, XYZ, whatever as well. So all uh, reinforcing that parent brand name. House of Brands Architecture. Cody, why don't, you, why don't you walk these fine people through what that is? House of Brands Architecture features a less prominent parent brand that could follow the background entirely to enable individual brands to stand on their own without any direct ties to the parent brand. This is less common with breweries. Um, I, I should say also, I'm the one that wrote this, and I think that that could fall to the background entirely. Actually, is just that falls to the background entirely. Mm -hmm. um, I think truly the, the House of Brands is like the shadow thing that controls it all without the, the, the public knowing. Uh, traditionally, the stock and trade of mega corporations like P&G and Unilever, uh, Unilever, I'll say that, makes me sound smarter. <laughs> this can be valuable depending on how varied your product mix is. Um, so some examples. So as we mentioned, go into your bathroom and, and just look at the back of your shampoo bottle or your toothpaste or whatever products you use, and you're going to find you probably won't see PNG, but you'll notice that PNG owns all of these things. And that's just a step removed once you start getting into this, like very quickly, you notice the Illuminati controls everything that, that exists in our world. It's all controlled by basically 10 companies and we are uh, subjects of that system. Um, coming back down from the stratosphere a little bit to alcohol, you see the same thing obviously in alcohol with Diageo owning all of these groups. And, and when we talk about a, um, House of Brands and Diageo like falling to the background, you're not going to see Diageo on the back of a Guinness can or Smirnoff bottle. Most people who buy these products probably don't even know what Diageo no. is at all. And no. that's intentional. I yeah. Mean, and there's no reason to either. I mean, provenance isn't really important to these things. It's more their their brand equity and story and why you buy Bailey's or whatever. Uh, coming back down to earth a little more with beer, we obviously see this in beer, AB InBev. You're not going to see, uh, you're not going to see that, that, uh, corporate sounding name on the back of a Budweiser bottle, um, probably brewed in America and owned elsewhere. This is the illusion of choice as Sam Calagione brilliantly says. Uh, and then we see this also for you guys that are opening different locations. A lot of folks, we'll talk about this here in a second, 
but uh, you can kind of become hospitality groups, breweries do, because they open a restaurant concept or they get an opportunity from like a, the, the local city to, to open a new concept. They get a lot of uh, benefits to do that. And so you do this kind of one-off thing. So we see that a lot with hospitality groups. This is Let Us Entertain You, which is my favorite named company. I have spent uh, many a wayward <laughs> hour in the crab cellar. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just talk about Crab Cellar for a minute. Uh, Darden, another one. Mm -hmm. I also have spent many an hour at Cheddar's. It's Bahama, Bahama Breeze. I uh, I take my wife to Bahama Breeze every year for our anniversary. <clears throat> Bahama Breeze. Uh, let's talk about down to earth, down on the ground, down <laughs> down to where to where we commoners are. So a client of ours, one of our some of our favorite people we ever worked with, Big Lug Canteen. Uh, they opened Big Luck Canteen in 2014, mm -hmm. 2014. Thereabouts. Uh, very, very popular, very fast brewing brew pub in Indianapolis. Uh, we're just going to fast forward here. About four years later, uh, I forgot that I put this slide in here. This is the interior of Big Luck. Uh, four years later, <laughs> he opened up Leader House, which is a Bavarian themed uh, kind of fine, fine ish dining. It's like stepped up casual plus type place for the, the nerdy restaurant folks out there. Um, they open this maybe three miles down the road. It's not. It, very far. It's a stone's throw away from their original location. As we were talking through how to approach this, they were a little bit worried about, well, if we've opened another big log canteen, are we cannibalizing ourselves a little bit? You know, are we going to spread ourselves too thin? Um, so ultimately the solution here, even though they're not SC Johnson, a family company or Procter and Gamble, they did go with a house of brands <laughs> strategy to, uh, to execute this. And then right in the back of, of leader house, they opened a third brand in their, house of beautiful brands called half leader one of my favorite places to eat in the city if not my favorite place now uh a barbecue and beer hall wonderful stuff um i was there saturday <laughs> um but but you see like they're not calling everything big lug barbecue hall big lug bavarian hall like they're not they're not doing that um this also extends to their retail products so in addition to opening these locations they picked up a, like a canning line and they started distributing their products like you know to third parties and they're able to expand the Big Lug brand to just be, um, to all fall under that Big Lug hospitality and yeah. Big Lug brewing umbrella. Yeah, subtle note here. These beers are from Big Lug brewing, not Big Lug canteen, even though they are, they hail from canteen. This is a Big Lug brand on shelf versus the canteen, which is that, that flagship location. So the really subtle change. And, and this is why we wanted to talk about this with you all. This stuff is important. Had they just called it Big Lug, you know, two or Big Lug South or whatever, that might be fine if it was 20 miles away, but even then I think that, that that would not really help them build their business the way they have. So quick snapshot of that. And then one more quick snapshot here to transition into the next part of our presentation. This is not a client of ours, but we are big fans of Braxton. So Braxton Brewing, I should have, they're in Kentucky, I think. I believe so. Uh, they have recently launched Vive or Vive, not sure how you say it, sorry Braxton. Uh, but if you notice, there's no mention of Braxton on this can at all. And that's very, well, I, I guess there's a tiny little bug there on the back, but that's a very specific reason for that. We're gonna talk about that in the next half of our presentation. And right now, uh, I think we are going to pause for questions. And does anyone have any questions? Let me go in the comments see anything at all anyone have any comments you guys are sleepy this morning i wonder if it's maybe not refreshing if i hit refresh i'll nuke the entire presentation though <laughs> yeah let's do this can you grab that laptop just to be safe we yeah. will uh we're going to continue presenting and i'm worried that can someone just <laughs> please clap can someone <laughs> just comment something so i can see if uh if the public comments are working, I'm wondering if they're not. And this is not good radio. Uh, let me <laughs> keep moving forward. Cody's gonna pull that up. All right. Let's talk about line extensions versus brand extensions while Cody is pulling up the uh, the feed today. So line extensions are, uh, this is a way to lend your established brand specific name to another product within the same category. An example we like to use is beer A begets beer B. Um, for example, let's say your beer is called most popular. 
most popular IPA becomes most popular juicy, becomes most popular imperial IPA. This is extremely common. And the reason for that is that new brand rollouts can be really expensive, uh, especially for those larger breweries that have to put time and treasure into developing the recipe and paying design fees and getting cans printed and getting their distributors prepped to get it all out there. By using your brand's name, uh, you can lend that level of trust to new beers, mitigate risk, and hopefully achieve velocity sooner. That's why people do this stuff. So some examples out in the market, uh, fats, actually, I'll just show some examples here. Uh, Voodoo Ranger IPA, I think Voodoo actually has several variants. So Voodoo Ranger IPA, Voodoo Ranger Juicy Haze, Voodoo Ranger X, Y, and Z. They have a lot of different examples. Uh, Ballast Point has done it famously for years with Sculpin. So Sculpin IPA, Sculpin Grapefruit, Sculpin Aloha, Sculpin, <laughs> got that wrong there. Uh, Sierra Nevada Torpedo, you able to pull that up? I, it, it's not coming up on the... Hmm. Technical difficulties here, folks. Oh, hold on. Test. Ah, oh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, folks. I just wasted all of Cody's time. <laughs> it looks like the comments are coming through. Uh, Sierra Nevada Tropical Torpedo, Torpedo, they extend that. Uh, Sierra Nevada Wild, you get the picture. I don't have to keep presenting these, but this is how you extend uh, or line extend the line. Uh, some other examples, High Lie and High Low. This is a very new one that Cigar City has released, which brings us to caveats with an exclamation point. Uh, there are people that know way more about branding than Kodo does. People that have written iconic books like Jack Tri, uh, Jack. Jack Trout and Al Rees, the, the, the folks that wrote Positioning and, and stuff like that, people that wrote Blue Ocean Strategy. There are a lot of people that are against line extensions and brand extensions because you can cannibalize yourself and lose focus. Uh, there are a lot of case studies that kind of counter that, but we do see a lot of people extend their brands to where the, the parent brand no longer means anything. So food for thought, you need to make sure that you're not losing focus as you continually extend that brand. Um, another fun one, is that you can reposition your core brand in a negative light. I don't think High Lie has this problem, but when you when you say High Low as the new brand, specifically like it's low alk or maybe even more importantly, it's low calorie, that, that gets people going, oh, I didn't know it was that high calorie for the, the main one. Should I not be drinking that anymore? I think famously that happened with Fig Newtons back in the day, I wanna say. I think I told you that was in the 90s, but I mm -hmm. think it was actually more recent than that. Mm -hmm. Fig Newtons released a, uh, a low fat version and then their overarching sales start slumping because people go i didn't realize that these delicious things were so high in fat that's weird <laughs> Which of course they're high in fat that's why they're so good let's talk about brand extensions Here you go cody brand extension is when you use your brand equity that was if you saw our talk yesterday we talked about brand equity a little bit the goodwill the recognition the trust that people have and what your business is doing and kind of what you represent to create a new product outside of your main category um we're seeing this a lot with breweries spinning out to seltzer sodas kombuchas ready to drink cocktail drinks things like coffee all sorts of stuff um exciting and creative stuff is happening um Another good example is if you open a restaurant or a tap room um, under the same brand and you're spinning out into maybe now you're serving food that you weren't serving before or you're partnering with somebody that you weren't partnering with before. So the more established and respected your company is, the more effective this approach will be. And so some examples, you kind of already understand how this works. If you're a brewery, you would open a distillery, for instance. Some examples that we see out there in the wild, uh, there's no brewing on this dogfish head logo, but this is dogfish head spirits, I think they call it. Rogue spirits, rainier gin for some reason. <laughs> and then this is where the, the space kind of explodes. And this is the, the thing that's in everyone's mind today. Uh, and Bud Light Seltzer, Corona hard seltzer, Topo Chico hard seltzer, that's the one in the news right now. Uh, Modern Times Coffee, uh, and, and we could have had, I think we initially had like 15 slides with seltzers, which we removed them <laughs> to save time. We just figure you guys know. You, you <laughs> probably get it. Again, caveats with an exclamation point. You generally want to stay within the same universe as your parent brand or your parent category, your main category. Uh, for example, if you're the best brewery in the state, you could probably make some great whiskey. We're thinking about your customers, your consumers, and their mind space that's a weird thing to say but how how they perceive this it's kind of a common sense thing it, it, is it a stretch that you're making this new type of product or does it make sense yeah if you're the best brewery in the state uh 
you can probably make some good whiskey, but you might not make a good car company. Which has a host of problems. You might not make a good uh, <laughs> a good wristwatch company. I don't know. It, it's like food and bev uh, can kind of intermingle, but even then, you should you should consider that. So you want to think about that. Uh, the qualities and promises that your parent brand offers should intuitively link to your new extension in a way that doesn't make people question it. A big potential downside. Um, is that if this new extension flops, if it is not well received, your overarching reputation can suffer. We like to get people to think about this as a referral. Uh, if you refer a doc, like your dad has a knee problem and you refer your doctor to him, you want that doctor, you're doing that because you know the doctor does good work. Uh, we do this with everyone, lawyers, doctors, even lowly design firms. When we refer people to service providers, we do it because that, that's our level of trust to them. Think about that when you're releasing new products under your name as well. And I think I just said that on this slide. Yeah, it's just yeah. that there can be blowback. Mm -hmm. if, if something isn't quite up to snuff or if you don't have something completely dialed in, um, that isn't necessarily just going to reflect on your new extension. It might kind of go back and reflect on your overall name. Let's talk about endorsed brands and co-branding. Um, endorsed brands, this is an interesting one. And, and we actually still learning about this ourselves. I know, I know we're supposed to be experts up here, but this is a very precarious thing and it's interesting. An endorsed brand is in this weird middle position where it's kind of an extension, but it's also kind of its own brand. And they feature, specifically it's called endorsement because it features a small endorsement of the parent brand. Uh, some big corporate examples here, Kellogg, you see that Kellogg's is a small endorsement on these, but they have their own brands. Like you go to buy Rice Krispies cereal or Frosted Mini Wheats or Frosted Flakes or Fruit Loops or whatever, you're not necessarily going to buy Kellogg's Fruit Loops or Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. And we see this in uh, today, we want to take a moment to talk here about um, seltzers and stuff like that. We see this all the time. And when we've discussed this with some of our clients, we think the approach and, and, and the sense that people do this is because they want to lend the trust if you think about like a brand extension right they want to lend trust to the product but but have it maybe set up so that eventually it can live on its own so maybe like in this case wild basin is a brand name wild basin boozy sparkling water that is a horrendous mouthful but uh there are different varieties of wild basin and then if you see at the bottom there there is the tonal oscar literally tonal like it's meant to kind of hide a little bit oscar blues in the bottom that is a small endorsement Great Divide, same thing. White Water is a brand that they have created. White Water Seltzers, I imagine, is what this is. Uh, maybe. Is that a seltzer? Can't Probably. Tell. Uh, Great Divide. Uh, we talked about Left Field yesterday. This is a client of ours. Uh, this is Ice Cold Beer, which is an endorsed brand. So eventually this could just become Ice Cold Beer if it sells enough and it looks like it might end up doing just that. And you see this all the I mean, again, we have five or six slides here. We could have probably put 25 slides. Uh, Founders Masagave. This is Odell Brewing Company. It's a wine extension. Boulevard, I had to look for a minute. Boulevards, Fling, Craft Cocktail. So it's not just seltzers, it's really any sort of extension. Shiner, Straight Shooter. Again, we think the reason you would do this, at least initially from a brand strategy standpoint, is to make a big splash initially, lend trust from your parent brand, but then maybe it could it could become its own thing at some point. If it comes big enough, it can be sold off. It can be spun into a big flagship brand, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. I'm talking about right now, actually. <laughs> it's like you're psychic. Yeah, it's like I built this presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about a horse or a spinoff or a standalone flagship brand. This is an interesting place because it is from a brewery that's already established. And this is when you spin off a product and that product specifically, it spin off a product into having its own uh, really deep brand, uh, rich brand. So it's big enough to overshadow your, your brewery's brand. And when you do this properly, it has a fully fleshed out brand and it's almost always geared towards lifestyle positioning. Uh, that I don't know that that's a rule, but the examples we're gonna show you here in a sec all adhere to that. And then it automatically, this is just kind of a fun point to, to reiterate what we're talking about in this talk it makes the parent brand a house of brands. It makes your brewery a house of brands automatically because now you have this other brand within your umbrella. Some examples that you are all probably aware of, 805 mm -hmm. is a Firestone Walker. I mean, we can get it. This is this is why this stuff, we're still kind of figuring this out ourselves. Like that's kind of an endorsed brand because it has Firestone Walker, but 805 is, I mean, it's his own website, which is a good tell that it's, uh, 
it's kind of a spinoff flagship. There's not even a name for this, actually. That's why we have like weird hybrid flagship horrors. Yeah. They are treating this like a spinoff because 805 ultimately stands on its own. You don't necessarily need to know about Firestone Walker to know about 805 at this point, I don't think. Yep. So a lot of saw so a lot of people do this or try to do this over the maybe like in 2016, 17, 18 with loggers. Uh, a lot of move just to make like a just a good drinkable lager, like a beer flavored beer, as people like to think they're originally saying, and then create a lifestyle brand around it. Um, some other examples, Dragon's Milk. This has been Dragon's Milk as long as I mean, I, re I remember drinking Dragon's Milk when we were in college mm -hmm. and not knowing it was from New Holland. So that's a good example. And you'll notice that we are showing websites rather than packaging. That's a good tell, as I mentioned, that this is a fully fleshed out thing on its own. If it has its own individualized web presence. That's a good tip to say, hey, this is kind of like a spinoff or they're trying to build this up to stand by itself. Yep. Yep. This is happening as we speak. Uh, Fat Tire recently or New Belgium recently spun off Fat Tire into a light. From our perspective, we didn't do the work, but when we're looking at it and thinking about the brand strategy, Fat Tire has taken on its own identity, its own packaging. And as you'll see here in the next couple of pages, lifestyle photography, I think it has its own website. So they they are doing this as we speak right now, spinning off Fat Tire to become its own brand. And that, that's a great example of what we talked about at the beginning of this section of the, the, the presentation. If the brand is large enough that it maybe competes with the overarching brand or there's opportunity to make it even bigger that maybe it needs to spin off onto its own because I won't say the parent brand holds it back, but it just has so much velocity that you can you can just build it into a thing. And Fat Tire definitely is, is I think would qualify for that. If you think about the lifestyle and how, how intrinsically linked that is to like Colorado and Colorado life, for instance. And then uh, one more here, Arrogant Bastard. This is a really solid example. Um, so packaging, obviously, but website and, and they, they get really fun. And this is a good example of how, how deep you can get with this. So like they have merch, they have co-branding. This is a really great Pilsner that we had when we were out in San Diego presenting last year with Metallica, which is interesting because I thought that Metallica was all sober. So we'll get into co-branding now. Uh, and we will wrap this talk up in record time. Look at our time. It's nice. <laughs> Co-branding is a strategic partnership between two companies to create a product that bears both of your names. It's actually kind of simple on it, on, it, on its face. Uh, you do this because it leverages the strength of both brands to create something cool and premium. Generally, uh, generally limited as well. You're typically not going to co-brand something just to make it a mainstay thing. It's going to be like this fun, quick little special thing. And the, the reason you would do this as a brewery is that it introduces you, your company, to that other company's audience. Uh, you see it a lot with collabs with breweries, but I think a better example in this space would be, um, well, I guess we'll, we should just show some examples. Uh, th this, is, this is Backward Flag, this is a client of ours. So they co-branded with different veterans charities to support them and raise money for them. So we designed these, these uh, fun custom labels to tell those nonprofit stories. but uh, this is Kettle House co-branding with a coffee company local to them. It's a client of ours out in Montana. This is a common one. Actually, we see breweries work with coffee companies all the time. Um, this is this is what I wanted to what I wanted to get at. New Belgium has an enormous audience, as does Ben and Jerry's. Them combining or co-branding is brilliant because it it, it gets it tell like it tells people certain things. Your values align. These are companies that, that, that say the same thing, they speak the same language, they, they march the same way. And it gets people that might like Ben and Jerry's ice cream buyer, big fella that buys that ice cream, uh, might, might buy a six pack of New Belgium now. Yeah, <laughs> the, uh, for sure, I want that. I think there's a geographic thing there too, like yeah, East Coast, West Coast, or East Coast, Western US. Like you can tap into markets that um, you would not necessarily have access to or awareness in otherwise. This is a, a fun one and falls right in line with all the fun stuff that Dogfish Head has done historically. But Dogfish Head co-branded with, I think this is a Woolrich, which is just a uh, vintage outdoor wool company. Uh, but you do that because your your values align again, the missions align. And it's a really great way, again, of, of promoting like kind of lifestyle positioning. They did one with uh, Merrill, I think, too. They have those super dope lime green uh, yeah. hiking shoes. I mean, sequence, yeah. <laughs> So a lot of fun opportunities you can do with co-branding. Um, and then this weird stuff that we saw. It gets, it gets kind of postmodern actually, when you start very quickly putting mustard in beer and start 
So this kind of stuff probably designed to be shared virally more than to actually be a serious competing product, but interesting examples of co-branding nonetheless. Mustard beer actually does sound good though. I want to try that. I'm not convinced. <laughs> not convinced, not a believer. <laughs> I could do the, I've seen pickle. I could do that, but I don't know about mustard. Pickle beer would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, let's wrap up and give you a few things to think about, and then we will take as many questions as you all have. Uh, we have been putting out a lot of videos on our YouTube channel. Check it out. Just go to YouTube, type in Kodo Design, uh, including a video on brand architecture. So if you're interested in what we talked about today, you can go learn more about that there. And then, as I mentioned, our new book uh, goes in, in depth on brand architecture as well. You can read that. You can, you can read it for free if you'd like. You can also buy it at craftbeerrebranded.com. And just to give you a snapshot of what's in the workbook, which and we put it away earlier, so I don't have a prop to hold up for you. <laughs> but we have a couple pages to actually help you work through which approach makes more sense for your brewery in the Craft Beer Rebranded Workbook. And then finally, for you all listening to us today and joining us, uh, you can use the code CBP book uh, for free shipping to within continental United States uh, through this Friday if you'd like free shipping on the book. Thank you for joining us today. Let me bring this window up. And please throw any questions you have. We have 15 minutes. We actually went really fast. So we'll go until you all are done with questions. Uh, and I see nothing right now. So I'm going to get coffee. <laughs> we will sit here awkwardly and just die. In well, front of here, I have a question, Isaac. So, yeah. so Thank you. by and large, um, the approach to breweries have been branded house. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that will continue at the rate that it's continued? Do you think that the sort of house of brands and or endorse brands as people spin out into other things are gonna become more and more common? Or what What do you see in the next year, the next three years, the next five years, whatever? The I do think the branded house will still be the, the most predominant approach because it makes sense for small businesses. I think the reason this is a valuable thing for people to think about is that when you launch new extensions, you should think about how they can affect your overarching brand. So even if you do become a house of brands, quote unquote, that's a behind the scenes thing. I think the more value from this conversation comes from thinking about what qualities and trust and stories and values are we lending to that new, uh, that new extension that could hurt or help us. So I do think that a branded house is gonna continue being the predominant, the predominant approach. Do you agree, disagree? I think I agree, um, but I do think more interesting things are going to keep happening because the market is forcing people's hands. It, it's very crowded and there's a lot of opportunity just outside of the beer space, yeah. just outside of what people have been doing since the craft beer revolution 2.0 exploded. Um, so I think we're going to see some interesting stuff that you can't even necessarily predict yet. Um, and I think that's kind of the nature of the type of people that run breweries. They're going to be kind of experimental. Um, yeah. Agreed. And try stuff out. Some of it'll work. Some of it won't. Um, on the topic of endorsed brands, do you think that is solely the province of the Oscar Blues, the the New Belgium, the these guys who have enough brand recognition that putting their tiny little logo on the front actually might lend credibility because, uh, and that's just a volume game at that point, a certain yeah. amount of customers understands what that is. Um, do you think that could translate to smaller breweries, either locally in terms of geography? What do you think about that? I think it definitely can translate to smaller breweries, but if you think about lending trust, I mean, you have to have something worth trusting. And, and we trust might be maybe not the best word in this context, but if you're a big brand that people know, mm -hmm. then endorsing a product makes sense because people see that and go, oh, I know uh -huh. and trust that thing. I mean, even if just like a base consumer level, this product isn't gonna poison me. Like if we think about like consumer protection, <laughs> yeah. but it's like also, oh, this product, this seltzer is probably gonna be good because I maybe even if I don't know, uh, who was it, uh, Oscar Blues, I know that name, they've been around for a while. So that that's the power of an endorsed brand. I think of the difference between something like White Claw, which, I'm, I'm lame and getting older every single day. And to me, that came out of nowhere as its own thing. And then Truly kind of came up against it. And I was more interested in Truly because I know like Boston Beer Company and the people behind that, like I'm more inclined to just be emotionally invested and say, oh yeah, I'm going to give that a shot. Even though honestly, like in a blind taste test, I might not know the difference. I would, I would argue that uh, because Boston Beer, their portfolio is no longer 
uh, Sam Adams. I mean, they're they're right. they've been was it Angry Grove or Angry Orchard? Yeah, yeah, they've had they're they're, and... they're I mean, they're always this is a philosophical thing, a campfire conversation, but they're always kind of bumping up against the BA's definition of craft brewery because they don't even make like the prominent products of beer. I would argue that you don't even you the layperson, just the the dude out there in the grocery store buying that truly doesn't know that it's from Boston beer. Steve, my friend Steve, mm -hmm. doesn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, he he was blown away when I said, "Yeah, mm -hmm. the portfolio is all seltzer and X Y Z." So so you know that as being yeah. an industry insider, most people don't. Probably there's not. A, yeah. There's a question rolling in here, uh, Edmundo. Would you suggest launching beer, kombucha, and seltzer under different brands for starting company or as endorsed brands? I think we just discussed a little bit about endorsement. I think endorsing works when you have a very well established brand. So if you were starting out. And it also depends on if you're selling like in large chain retail versus just out of your tap room. Cause we see a lot of breweries release seltzers very successfully just as like, you know, pro sell process, but like, you know, XYZ brewery seltzer. I think the and thinking there is line. like, I'm going to be buying this stuff anyway. I might as well support the guy down the yeah. street that I know. Um, yeah. But it, you know, if you're a brewery in even like mid to let's say mid market metropolitan area, if your name is well known, in, in even just a city of you know a million plus that could move more units by endorsing it if people recognize your brewery name yeah um smaller than that i, I don't know i just don't know if that matters as much because again what you're doing is you're lend lending the weight of your brewery brand to get someone to say oh, okay i'm going to give this a shot because i trust them i like their stuff i know what they're about and i think this is going to be worth my money you know we saw something interesting real time especially I I think it was White Claw, like a 2017, 18 phenomenon, like from there to here. And you and I saw in real time breweries is real popular, like Virtue Signal and hold your nose and say, you know, like we'll never make seltzer. That's all <laughs> bullshit. And then you start seeing the numbers. It's like grows like 8,000, yeah. 8 million percent over year over year. And, and, and more and more breweries like go from holding their nose to making it to just making it to like making more of it than beer. <laughs> and and I, I don't I don't want to call anyone out. It doesn't no. matter. But the. the the, this whole conversation uh, really does stem in a lot of ways from breweries not wanting to, in a smart way, not wanting to hurt their positioning as you know breweries making mm -hmm. beer. But I think increasingly consumers, I hate using that more robotic term, but us people that buy the, these products, we are aware that breweries are doing this, maybe even in COVID days, like we know that they need to do whatever they can do to stay open. And I think that it's not, it's, it's decreasingly an issue. I, I, I don't look down on a brewery at all for making a Listen, seltzer or anything. I heard the exact same argument when people were saying, no, we're not going to make hazy IPAs. No, oh, yeah, we're not going to make sure. fruited yep. blank. We're not going to make kettle sours. We're not going to make X, Y, Z, like whatever the new thing that's doing volume is. And then you look two years down the road and everybody has one and they're all pretty good. <laughs> so it's like, maybe, maybe it's getting out ahead of ourselves a little bit and th thinking about worrying less that it would be a violation of principle and thinking about it more from the customer perspective who wants to buy these things anyway. And honestly, if you put a good one out there, they'll support it. I mean, I think a good lesson in life is to always leave yourself a way out. So if you're going to mm. talk a lot of shit about a product or a thing, maybe just be kind of quiet about it because <laughs> you don't know when the yeah. next pandemic will destroy your Correct. entire industry and country. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a life lesson from Kodo to you. Any other questions? How about you? Any other questions? I should ask you a smart question, but my brain's not working. Yeah, and my brain is barely working. The coffee's helping me a little bit get revved up. Um, Our pleasure, Mundo. Thank you. <sighs> Co-branding. What criteria should someone use to decide who should we partner with? Um, a lot of the more interesting ones I've seen have actually been food and beverage with a non-food and beverage. I, I gave the example earlier of Dogfish Head and Merrill mm -hmm. in a way that's brilliant because Merrill is super trusted by hikers. Dogfish Head wants to be in that outdoor kind of lifestyle positioning that frankly, everybody yeah. in those markets wants to be in. So that makes a ton of sense. How do you measure the criteria of, does this make sense? How do you fit up a partner? How do you make sure that you go into that and get out of it what you need other than it was just a cool little thing? How do you think about that? Well, even just inside baseball, you and I, Kodo, are working on some co-brands with some companies right now. And it, it, I, I think I, I will take a not anti-business, but this isn't a traditional business answer because everything we do should be talking about, you know, how can we increase profit mm -hmm. and top line and X, Y, and Z. But I think when you're, when you're talking about co-branding, I view it almost entirely as a marketing opportunity. Mm -hmm. And specifically through that, 
I think that the number one consideration needs to be your values. Does we, we have our own values as a business, Kodo does, and, and the breweries and the companies that we are currently working on projects with, um, they share our values. And so if, if, I mean, it can boil down oftentimes just you're friendly with them. You like them, you drink beer with them, you fish mm -hmm. with them, you camp with them, whatever it is. Uh, but I think that the values aligning means that specifically because, and why am I mentioning values, the customers of those other groups that you're working with buy them because of those values, whether we like to think about it that directly or not, that means that they're going to be open to our values or your brewery's values. And so I've said that word 20 times now, but I think the values is the most important thing there. Do you, do you agree differ? Um, yes, I do. I, however, I don't think most people think about it that way, even though they do, if that makes sense, you know, no one's saying, ah, yes, uh, Dogfish Head has my values. I think they'd probably <laughs> say like, I love Sam and I love, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, X, yeah. Y, and Z. No, yeah, it's like like Dogfish Head led me on this journey. Let's just keep going with yeah. them, along with them. I think I think it's more emotional than values. However, I think if once you pick it apart and really look at the moving parts, that's probably the most important factor. If you it's, it's what, the... What's important to us? Why do we do the things that we do? Why is it a good fit? Why why does why does the alignment make sense to someone at the end of the chain? Yeah, why do we want to associate with this company and vice versa? That's a great question, Cody. Thank you. Anyone Come on, else? guys. I'm, I'm dunking on you here. <laughs> Sheesh. I'm giving the talk and the questions. <laughs> Don't make me beg. <laughs> Please clap. <laughs> <sighs> it's kind of a weirder topic. Um, yeah, it's because not. it's more abstract than a lot of the talks that we usually give. But as you mentioned, brand architecture is becoming increasingly important. Morgan says, I completely agree. Values matter most to me too. Yeah, and like, even if you don't use that sort of boardroom language, I think that that's what it boils down to ultimately. Yeah. It's how does this make me look if I get involved with this? What do I get out of it in my life and what I want to accomplish? And and I think that, that capital V values is kind of the key well, to understand. I mean, we can continue using the sterile boardroom talk like values, but you brought up uh, Dogfish Head and Merrill. Mm -hmm. Let's talk, let's talk again, kind of sterile about value proposition. Sequench dominated the world. Fantastic release from uh, an old brewery that just continues innovating and blowing. Yeah, yeah, the they've managed now, to not get. Now, the reason the reason that Sequench, specifically not Dogfish Head, but Sequench is a beer, which if we're talking about uh, that, that's that will likely, if not already, becoming a horse and a spinoff thing because mm -hmm. of something. But they co-branded with Merrill because Merrill is an outdoor, like they had, it, I think I remember correctly, it's a trail running shoe. So mm -hmm. it's also not just values, but it's value proposition. It's the positioning of the product itself. Right. You drink That's this, brilliant. you drink this beer because it's lower carb, lower calorie, and you're also probably out and about. So here's a shoe that can help you do that. I, I don't. I don't know if they do, but there's athletic brewing company, which makes like, they call them functional beers, which I don't know how that gets past TTB, but they make, <laughs> they make beers that have like electrolytes and stuff like that for out or not for outdoorsy, but for, uh, for like, after you, you do your run for those psychos that run just for fun. Like you, I, I bet that they have similarly co-branded products with shoes and stuff like that. We have a question. Have you ever turned down working with someone because they didn't share your values? Yep, we have. Uh, we, we get a lot of, uh, <laughs> We get a lot of uh, vape companies, not mm -hmm. not THC, which we're, we're pro THC vape, but like just shitty Nic nicotine. Like, yeah, like uh, uh, what's it called, um, Mister Mister Vape or whatever whatever they have at the gas station down here. <laughs> yeah, we have we turned down one of those a quarter. Uh, obviously, tobacco. Like we, like you, have had a lot of people in our family die from that shit. Uh, but also, just we've had breweries come to us that that make shitty beer. And, and they kind of even acknowledged it. And that's a weird place for us. So we take the, the coward's way out and we're like, ah, we're too busy. <laughs> but, but yeah, we definitely yeah. don't work with people if their values don't align with yeah, them. Yeah, it's, it's not like we're saying you're not good enough to work yeah, with we, us. We're just kind of like, okay, well, either do an exorbitant quote that nobody would say yes to to, to scare them away or just be like, you know, or, or, or <laughs> we're, that's it. We got too much work right now. We, we just can't do this. There's an industry term for that. It's called an F off quote. Uh, <laughs> and send a few of those. Give them the old skedaddle. Some of those convert and then you're in a weird place. You're yeah. like, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and then, and then the ultimate truth in America is that everyone's for sale. <laughs> you just need it. That price. That's correct. Good question, Morgan. How about you? What do you, are you a designer or a brewer? Have you ever worked with anyone that didn't share your values? 
Let's bear our souls to each other. <laughs> we'll so wait for that to come in. I can think of it, they're very, very rare in the 11 years that we've been doing our thing, but I can think of a couple examples where we got into something and then we yes. discovered that maybe our values weren't uh, yeah. on the same page when initially it seemed like it was going to be a good fit and it was going to work, but then you, you kind of push past that a little bit and you're like, oh, oh yeah, no, oh no. It's more, and, and part of that was being like kind of green, like wet behind the ears and just kind of being like fresh fresh and idealistic and, and not not looking at it from a cynical standpoint, but you kind of learn, learn for the tells of that as well. Yeah, founding a business right after graduating college is great because you miss it, like you skip all the hubris that, that we saw as interns, but uh -huh. then it's also bad because you don't understand how like real businesses work. <laughs> it's yeah, it, it, can, it can be brutal and it can be very rewarding. So that's kind of what that's that exactly, journey is like. It's exactly how I put it. Yeah. I think we'll end on that brutal and rewarding. <laughs> any, uh, any other final questions, get them in there quickly. Otherwise we will, uh, we will close this window out and we need to go get beer and lunch for our, our meeting. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, any questions and otherwise we'll, we'll dip out. Nothing. We're going to call this done. Check out our YouTube, follow us on Instagram, use that code CBP book if you want a free, uh, free shipping. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate all of your time and your questions. And we will, uh, well, we won't talk to you for a while. Yeah. <laughs> talk to you later. See y'all. Thanks, guys. Cheers.